Hello, this is the Women Being Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know more about feminist topics. Before we start, I would like to remind you that on our website, womanbeing.co.uk, you can find our online and digital magazine with content created by women across the world. My name is Monica Martins, and today my co-host, co-director of Women Being and photographer, Kat Lugos, will be speaking with Edinburgh-based photographer, Yannicka Hani. Hello to both, and thank you so much for uh, joining this conversation. I would first like to ask Yannicka to introduce herself and introduce the project where the blackboard sings, and then you both can take it from there and continue having this photographer's conversation, which I'm pretty sure is going to be really amazing. My name is Janneke Hanni. I'm a Swedish photographer living and working in Edinburgh, Scotland. I moved to Scotland in 98 after finishing university at Stockholm, where I studied anthropology and criminology. And I, I studied photography here. I worked as a photographer for years, but I guess the most important work I done is when the blackbird sings and i know quite a lot of people are familiar with the work now due to my censorship on instagram and facebook but actually um i just had another ban this weekend and what really came up was that actually when i started to work when i started to create the work that later on became when the blackbird sings it was actually emerged out of failed ivfs and several attempts to create life. So it's a very long story. And that's why I always feel a little bit thrown when, when, when I'm trying to recall it and tell it again, because actually it really started in 2016. And at that point, me and my partner tried to create life for two and a half, three years. And we decided to go down the route of IVFs. So I went to Stockholm and I went through two IVFs. And also through that process, I became, at the age of 40, which is ridiculous, I became really aligned with how nature and, and the reproduction system is totally interlinked. So um, every ovulation and every period became really distinct moments in my month. Meanwhile, I was going for loads of walks because I was obviously really I was about to say stressed out, but it was very intense. And during these walks, I became really aware of the moon's travel across the sky. So that's just one part of it. And then in 2016, we all know what happened in the world in 2016 too, which was detrimental with everything that unfolded in the States. And I also lost my grand. I had my second IVF and my first period after my second IVF that didn't obviously work out on a super new moon so i was just like fuck it and <laughs> i went out at this super new moon in october bleeding with a friend of mine and we decided to burn some intentions and i had this stupid fertility dolls that i bought in south africa and clearly they didn't work right so i was like i'm going to put them on fire and i remember burning them and they were floating down at the water leaf half burnt they wouldn't even burn properly you know and my friend said to me, what about if we do a shoot? And actually the super new moon happened during twilight. So all this is just nature doing things. So I brought my camera and you see, I know we're going to talk about this later on and it's the female gaze. But when I first started to photograph when I was 28, I started off with photographing my friends naked because who doesn't love a naked female body? You know, but I left that for years because I really felt like it wasn't good enough to just photograph naked women because they look amazing. I also had to sort out my own female gaze. But in 2016, I went straight back to where I started. So I photographed Maddie. No one seen those pictures because she didn't want me to use, use them for my exhibition at Arusha Gallery in 2018. So I um, they're still on my hard drive. And the main thing with my work was the session with a woman rather than creating hot images. 
So I did these pictures and I saw what happened there in the twilight, a very short period of time, a very liminal space where light is moving within the 20, 15 minutes. And uh, it didn't only give me strength, it, it, it made me feel reassured that I could create something else. Maybe it wasn't a baby, but I could give birth to something else. So I went back to my partner and I said, wow, you know what we've done every full and new moon, every ovulation and every period, I'm going to do exactly the same, but I'm going to create the exhibition. And I knew that I just couldn't move forward without strengthening myself and i knew the only way to strengthen myself was to strengthen the women around me and what was really cool with this journey was that the women i photographed included my mum and her neighbor was women who came into the project i'd never had a premeditated kind of list of different sizes different ages different skin colors different this and different that it was just it, it was a very organic flow so I went on this journey for a year and um, photographed women and nature all around Scotland and Sweden and then I exhibited as I mentioned at the Russia gallery in 2018 and then the censorship happened and I was just so um, shocked because I never knew that really connecting with nature would be so completely threatening to the external capitalistic world where power structures are thriving on women, women who bleed and women who do bleed, their insecurities. And I think it's quite a lot of levels there, but I was, um, I had images removed from Instagram of my best friend's very stretch marked stomach. And we all know how many images we have of six packs on Instagram. There was images removed on my mom's beautiful wavy fat um, bulks of niceness around her midriff. It was images that were removed of my friend, a, a male friend, his torso, because someone meant that you could see his pubes. And I was actually questioned that, like, but where do they stop? Because he has a beard as well, you know? So it, it kind of unleashed something else. We all seen your images and I've been to the exhibition. It's absolutely beautiful, right? And obviously whoever is listening can, can have a look at your website and see the images themselves as well. And um but obviously there's absolutely no like sexual link to, to any of the images that you have, right? I just wonder what is then that makes people censor or the algorithm, whatever that is, whether it's a, it's a person who reports your picture or it's, it's just an algorithm, what makes it view the picture as, as explicit? I think I have a few different answers. I, I, I don't think anyone reports my pictures. That's the feeling I have. I, I, I was speaking to a friend in Sweden yesterday and she does health, like vagina health, and she has been reported quite a lot of times uh, she has been reported because how can you take control of your own vagina steaming your vagina looking after your own vaginal health you know it's because you see i find that very empowering but i think with my images is number one i don't think people report them and the algorithm does not work right so people are like it's too much flesh it's too much skin it's too much this but i see images all the time with the tiny little strawberries on the nipples and a tiny little thong because as long as you have a thong then that image doesn't break the community guidelines so obviously the robot isn't like mm -mm -mm. It, it, it's something else going on but what i do think I, I don't think my images are sexy in the conventional way, the porny way, of course not. I think they really fueled with sexuality in the sense of I, they, they're very powerful. And I can talk quite freely about my images in that way because I feel like I am holding the camera. I am seeing my light. It's my journey through what's unfolding there in the twilight, in that liminal space. However, 
I genuinely feel like these images are coming from somewhere else. I don't know if it's from the God or from the devil or, but it's something else shifting. I can sense it when I'm there in that liminal space in the twilight. It's like I see the woman or the man I'm with fully, but then it's something else. And that's something else. I can't really put words onto that. But what I do know is in some kind of way, it's threatening because if you're beautiful, and when I use the word beautiful, I mean full of power, full of life, full of, mm, which is much sexier than, you know, I mean, that kind of stereotypical sexy. When if you are just you, full, there laying in nature, then everything, the, the, all the structures around us starts to rumble because not only are we possibly buying less anti-aging and uh, clothes that pushes in and pumps up it's like it, it just doesn't work anymore if we completely align with nature itself then all this that we see around us is falling apart and it's kind of really scary and exciting at the same time you see here's the thing i think it's a censorship because we can't be fat we can't be old uh, we can't be trans all these things that puts us in, into a liminal space where it's too confusing. It needs to be black and white. If we fit all these people in, in between, then what is it then? Then I don't understand, right? And here's the other part of it. So all these ages, um, tones, uh, cultures, um, whatever it is, the full spectrum, literally of humans, there's not space for us. And here comes the other part. I don't think it's a vendetta. I don't think it's a ill, or is it? Maybe it is. I don't think necessarily Facebook is evil. Perhaps it is. You see, I don't even have answer for this. But I also think, here comes the thing, which is the worst part of it. If they were just being nasty bastards, right? Censoring like, she's too fat. Ugh, she's too hairy. Ugh, she's too old. Then that would be easy. Again, then it's black and white. I think it's much more complex. I think people as in social media online we're just not here's the one we're just not used to see that so even we who sit here having this conversation are so kind of a bit more aware of these power structures we get shocked so actually if you look at this your own female gaze in your head you could be like yeah, all bodies are beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, this is beautiful and this, but you kind of know you have that kind of wee funny feeling inside you. We're like, oh, I can do it. but that's a little bit too much. I can do it with hairy armpits, but hairy nipples. Oh my God. So for, for example, right? Hairy armpits, I'm like this, remove it all or keep it. It shouldn't be a statement. Do what the fuck you want for your body. But when my hairy nipples start to go out, I'm like, oof. Man, okay, now they've been here for a week and Olaf hasn't seen it. Maybe I just remove a couple, you know. Do you see what I mean? And that's me who works with bodies. But we have to talk about this because if we don't go into these details, we're never going to heal it from the inside out. And that's how severe it is. So one good thing with this project, not only for me, but a lot of the people I photographed is to just be seen as you are is healing by itself. So I can genuinely say all bodies are beautiful bodies. And I mean, full of power. I photographed my brother's um, wife now, who's a weightlifting champion. She's as beautiful as my mum, who's turning 70. There is no difference there. It's just, here it comes. It's just the bodies in nature. Who would look at a tree and go like, oh my God, look at that oak. Poof, it's too old. Look at that old oak. I wish I seen a young oak. It's like that's how simple it is because we are just we're just nature. But then it's all these layers and then it becomes like a society and culture and how we shape by culture. And of course, with fashion, all clothes doesn't fit everyone. I don't think it does. I mean, I'm not going to lie about it, but I think the problem with the censorship is. I genuinely believe that if we all found that part within us, the, 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 the vulnerable part, really human part of feeling really alive, it would be, how should I say, detrimental for power structures at the moment, because where do you go after that, you know?
and it's not about being happy it's just about being a full human i think so i think the censorship is it's just people are not used to see it and then i don't think it's that sinister i hope not but then if you allow it all then what will happen yeah that's a good question right because um yeah absolutely what would happen if you allow all but i am totally inclusive i'm even inclusive with oh i don't want to say his name but that very angry i'm judgmental now but that really angry male energy he just goes into you obviously have that within women too but it's a very within the structures that we're living in now it's it suits it you know mm -hmm. the cutting off not just cutting off externally but within you you know and how people do that and then become successful i mean one of the worst ones is like when people are like but margaret thatcher was a woman and i'm like just because you have a cunt doesn't mean you're a woman right <laughs> which actually yeah. talking about female <laughs> gays i'm just going to say about female gays when i'm talking about vaginas just because i have a vagina yes. that doesn't mean i have a female gaze and i think I'm so more so uh, more so with women we've been so gazed at that we don't even know what lenses we're looking through and i think for me really picking that apart was essential to be even able to do this work because like oh god i get really irritated now when i think about it the main thing is i guess in this world is like this doesn't work people are really suffering so the only way to change that is to go within really examine yourself really connect with your shadow side connect with the predator that you have within you we're surrounded by predators so of course that would be within you too you have a part to play in that too you are the one who's judging people more so subconsciously than consciously i spoke to someone the other day and i actually think maybe i want to use the word bias but I think we all have an eternal racist. It's just that you haven't found it if you're totally denied. And it's the same with the female gaze. Who doesn't want to have go on a free holiday across a female body, down the spine, over the bum, coming up over the breasts? But like, who has allowed that in the first place? Usually for me, uh, I was very shaped by the movies I was watching in the early 80s, and they were great movies, but I was quite young. So I was watching Belle de Jour, Clockwork Orange, <laughs> sorry, it's a lot, <laughs> like all these kind of crazy movies um, where female bodies were used in a way that I don't actually think necessarily represent real life. I remember all the rape scenes I saw. I don't even watch movies like that anymore in the 80s, start of the 90s, where uh, in the rape, it was always a blouse getting pulled open and there was a big pair of boobs falling out, right? And we all know, you, I'm sure that happens too, but usually the general standard rape doesn't look like that, you know? It's, it's even those kind of crucial scenes that we get fed with are a misleading kind of story. So I talk a lot about visceral diet. I think at the moment for me, I'm, I'm totally on the diet. I really examine what I eat through my eyes and not. Um, I think especially on social media, we really need to be aware of that we get all our vitamins and the minerals as in diversity. I mean, we're not going to get diversity to that degree because everyone isn't represented, as you know, with my account has been restricted. So even if we think we're getting a diverse uh, diet or like a, a diet full of all the vitamins and minerals and um, visually we're still missing people i mean if you want to look at talk at talk about straight men they don't even exist either they like like with a six pack and they're 21 or it's like trump you know like all these men in between they they just they don't exist either so it's so many different levels of it yeah i find it also interesting that you you do include also men in your photographs as well there was this uh, photograph with um uh, i think father and uh, and, uh, and their kid 
And that was really beautiful because it brings that, you know, different also way of looking at masculinity, at body of a man that's also naked body of a man that's not sexualized neither because they do get sexualized too, right? So it kind of brings this kind of human, totally human experience of like nature and love and connection. And, um, you know, it's, it's totally across gender, right? I mean, it was, it was an interesting one because when I photographed my project, when the Blackbird Sings in 2016 to 17, was only women and people kept on asking about men and actually annoyed me because I was like, ah, I'm looking after the sisterhood now. This is this is my focus, and I kind of I got annoyed when people kept on asking me because I felt like they were um, bothering me, to be honest. And then on the first of December two thousand and nineteen, I went around to my uh, a friend of mine and his husband's house and stayed over, and that was the first man I photographed. And so then it was Scott with his husband, and I had been very I'm, I'm going to carry on doing that and i've been very curious about that path because i don't want to say the word healing but if we're going to change something in this world then we will need to do all of us not just one group all of us and kat it's really beautiful what you said because i started to phot photograph men that i feel connected to and um, when i photographed this man that you talk about his well actually it was a man and his whole family i was accused by a woman on instagram of promoting pedophilia so here's the other part of uh, masculinity and men being naked with kids is that unfortunately visually people link that to the predator so you see how much it is to start to heal here and I was talking to the same man uh, and that I photographed with his whole family about, he was asking me about photographing men and I'm very, um, and I'm talking about men here, you know, um, I, I'm really curious about that, but I, I, was, I had a very open conversation about it to him. And I said, I just feel really uncomfortable if I would go out into the woods. So basically the women I photograph I literally, sometimes I go to the countryside in Sweden, she picks me up at the train station, we go into the woods, we share the twilight together, and then I even stay over in her house, right? Uh, sometimes the women are gay, sometimes the women are straight. Imagine doing that with a straight guy, I would just be like, fucking no chance, right? So this is what happened within me. Going into the woods. And Manu said, why would you, why do you feel uncomfortable about that? And I was like, well, I wouldn't. But I just don't want the guy to book me for the wrong reasons. I just don't want the guy to start to get a hard on. I don't want the guy. You see, it's all these things that a lot of women are fearing. I, do, I was like, I just don't want to put myself in that situation. And then my 46 year old me, I was like, but what does it really matter if the guy starts to get a hard on? It's like, whatever, the dude is like a bit of a pervert, but like, whatever, you could just leave. And then I was like, but then you see, it's going to trigger something inside me again. And what gets triggered is that I feel like I'm being abused once again. Like how many people hasn't had been walking past at the tender age of 11, uh, past the woody area or uh, bushes and someone is standing there wanking, you know, it's like a remembrance of what we have, most of us, men too, experienced around the male energy. Um, so it's a really tricky one. And I think what's really why I'm talking about it, it's not because men are bad, it's more so that their sexuality, women's sexuality is really damaged, but male sexuality have been so damaged that it's totally pushed down into a darkened hole somewhere in the underground where I actually even find it difficult to retrieve some wholeness there. It being shattered. It's like I had dick pics sent to me where when I get these pictures, I'm actually like, I'm not like, ah, oh, this is fucking disgusting. I'm just like, oh, it's just another penis. But what makes me think is like, this guy sent me a picture of his penis. It's like, it's not a part of him, right? Imagine if I started to send you pictures of my cunt. You guys would be like, 
where's the full nice picture of the full body but like it's almost like when you start to send it away like that it's like it doesn't belong to you and i think that's the problem it's like with the male sexuality to a certain degree it has been dislodged from the body itself so going back to when the blackbird sings i am going to do that but it's a full-on process within me and I have had some people getting in touch with me about it and I have sensed because I'm quite sensitive that mm, maybe it doesn't come from the right place in the sense of not exposing yourself to yourself more so exposing yourself to the other do you understand that so it's instead of going into the woods with me to feel you it's something with showing me but then I also have been approached by a lot of men who's just, I, I feel really not only honored, but like really warm in the heart that they have approached me to put themselves in that very vulnerable position. Yeah, that, that, there are so many conversations we can have just from you just, <laughs> you know, the, um... Oh my gosh, yeah, where to start? <laughs> we don't have time for that. Um, so going back to the idea of the gaze, um, basically people who you photograph, who, who are standing in front of your camera are giving themselves to your gaze, right? And uh, the gaze of people, uh, of internet audience or an exhibition audience. How does the process of selecting images for internet or exhibition use work like do do does people have any say in that are they are they involved when i created the exhibition i photographed uh, nature and woman at every full and new moon what i decided before i even saw the images was that if the woman didn't want me to use the images i wouldn't use them because for me, it was much more important that the work fundamentally was strengthening women than that my photography side was like getting up there on the walls of Arusha Gallery. I mean, I had, it's a couple of women who didn't want to be in the exhibition. And I remember the photography side inside me was like, fuck sake, these images are amazing. But I really, and I still work like, uh, if someone doesn't want me to use the images and there's some really good images out there on my hard drive, I never use them. That's the most important thing. Second important is that if, if someone feels a bit challenged and scared, but not in the sense of that they feel anxious and worried about it, I always support them and push them gently to use the images not only for my Instagram page, but for their Instagram page. Because for me, these kind of ego thoughts that we have sometimes that we don't look as young as we think we look or we, we feel like we're too skinny or too fat or the bum is too small or too big. Sometimes it's good to just forget about that and share your story and your body with other humans all of us because this is how we change the stereotypical kind of view of bodies because if we don't do that the only images we are going to see is the young white slim female so if someone feels anxious i'm just like no 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 like if it's too much then definitely just just enjoy the images and 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 hold them close to your heart but if you can i always always encourage people to share them you know if it's me it's a me gazing people are giving themselves to my gaze i there is my eyes are definitely involved in this process and it's i see through my eyes so it is my gaze but also you see when i photograph humans in the twilight it's it, the light is so on a technical level the light is so low that the only thing i really see is shapes so i see shapes of nature i see shapes of leaves sometimes i see the shape of the 
roundedness of moss. I see the roundedness of someone's thighs. I see it's only shapes and it's something nice with that because when we talk about female gaze, it's all, when I think about female gaze straight away, what popped into my mind was these kind of black and white erotic nudes, Helmut Newton or something else. But for me, it goes beyond female gaze because obviously I photograph um, old people now and it's the shapes of the human in nature, what reflects light and where the light sinks in. And also people usually pick their favorite part of the woods. I help them with it if they can't find it. But usually I ask people where they feel comfortable, which is such a weird thing. It's like, where do you find a nice space in the woods? Where do you feel comfortable? So they go through process themselves. And the other part is like, I support and help people with, I don't want to call it poses, but where to rest in this space. But more so, I want people to find their own resting space. I want people to sink into that moss themselves. I photographed Olaf a couple of times and it's really cool because he's obviously a 51 year old straight white male and he's also my partner. So it's loads of kind of emphasize on that. But what I noticed was that the session, session I had with him when the lockdown kicked in here last year in the start of last year was just as it was with anyone and he I said to him, how are you feeling? And he had something over his eyes where he was like, oh, it's, I'm just listening to the birds. And it's something with that to be held in nature, hold, hold by someone so you're not lonely in that space. And then just find your weight there in the ground to let the ground support your body and then sink into that. It's, I think it's only a couple of times where I see that people can't rest in that space, you know, and it's not because they're restless. It's more so because we have so much pressure on us to look good or feel good is another one. And I think with the blackbird, it's anything goes because in that liminal space, it gives you that pause. You don't have to be productive and alert like you are during the day. You don't have to be sleeping because if you don't sleep during the nights, you're mental. You know, it's, it's, it's an in-between space who opens up for everything. And it's always the person I'm photographing is the person ruling. So even if I think that something would work better in a visceral way, I don't even think like that because that's not the process, then I let the person direct and the person is the owner of the images always. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, I really um, felt deep connection to what you said about um, yeah being photographed in nature or, or finding your space in nature. Because um, once I was photographed by a friend photographer, uh, also naked in the woods, like in the, you know, like inside a tree trunk or, uh, you know, um, in the grass. And it was really beautiful experience like you kind of sink into it of course and you find you find your kind of space and you kind of become i want to say one with nature that sounds really hippie yeah, <laughs> sounds so hippie. Like, thing is though, this is this is the thing is so beautiful it's like i'll have to cry now it's like this is the whole thing you do find your space because there is a space there for you like you are nature it's not something you need to connect with it's not you don't have to hug a tree it's like it's you we're all connected it's it's we're all breathing the same oxygen like the beat that is going through us is also going through nature it's like it's so like i get so moved because it's so true you know like i don't know about truth but like i feel it when you say that it's because even when you said it, Kath, it's like, I think about it, it's like, so what do you do? And actually, this is what I do for a living now, because people book me to do the sessions. And I'm like, yeah, I photograph people naked in nature. And I'm like, oh, my God, it sounds so contrived, but it's so basic and it's so important. But it's something with, ah, let yourself, let the body needs to, it doesn't need to relax, because I had people pulling and stuff, like doing things in nature, but it needs to 
connect, sink into just the words you described. And it's plugging into that or just reminding yourself that you are all that is essential. And it's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and uplifting. And it's, it's everything to me. And I think it's a lot to everyone. It's just to be able to visit that space, you know. And if it's too cold to get naked, it's like just lay on the ground, let, feel the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Feel feel the the temperature of the ground, feel the texture, and it's it's it's, it's a very empowering experience as well. Especially, I think when we don't have that every day. And I wonder as well. I mean, it's difficult in Edinburgh because you can't really get undressed and run down the water leaf naked because you're probably trod in dog shit and stuff. Because you know how nature gets dirty by people. Nature itself is not dirty, you know. It's like, actually, we are making the nature dirty. So when I do the shoots, I totally go into the woods. So there won't be any dog poo on your ass or like, you know, you won't be like ending up with a, um, like an energy drink on your head. Do you know what I mean? But I think as well with nature, it's really interesting if you look at different ages, w women and different ages, I guess, like when when do you think nature is scary? When do you think nature is dirty? When when are you fearful about mud on your arms? Where is where when does wet leaves get too much for you? And I think you can relate that to the different ages of when we're a bit more disconnected from our bodies. I just think it's a shame that it took me. 40 years to really start to feel my ovulations and sink into this space uh, in a real way and i hope for the next generation that we can all make that process shorten that process but i can also see that it's no one guiding us how do you even know about this going into the woods and laying in the tree cat if you don't have someone photographing you like where where does these stories how do they surface without people creating work around it and I think in the old like 200 years ago possibly we would have naturally be sitting around the fire someone would be playing a drum and not on zoom having these conversations or maybe we wouldn't have these conversations because we wouldn't be so removed from our inner power yeah I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about how what you said about the nature kind of being perceived as dirty do you think that if you photographed um the same bodies in the same way in a space that's uh, not outside in the studio space for example would they be kind of how people view these pictures would be or how, how whatever it is that the algorithm or facebook or the, the god of internet you know how they view those pictures um would that be different than than the bodies in nature that nature brings that kind of um connection to the body yeah th this thing that nature is dirty therefore bodies in the nature are dirty they kind of primal uh, untamed mm -hmm. dangerous you know but i guess it's dangerous because it's not controlled so uh, just going back to that i think the most dangerous thing would be uncontrolled women and as we know already um the witches that were burned were wild uncontrolled women because a lot of them were midwives and a lot of them were working with healing and a lot of them didn't do any of that they were just accused for some kind of random reason and didn't fit in and um, so i think the wild nature is the most dangerous thing and when we adapt onto humans everyone get really scared but we are also nature i think as soon as you move your body into uh, studio, I've done that too, of course, it, it gets overlapped with all these stories and ideas. And I think for studios, if you want to keep it really safe with Instagram, make sure you have a young, um, hairless, slim, female body. Just cover up the nipples and literally the hole, and then you will actually be okay. But I think it's something very confusing for online usage, like the algorithms or whatever, when it's actually not that. And I also think with the female gaze, since I picked it apart so deeply within me, it's like, the, it's actually really difficult to see any images whose 
powerful for women. I'm going to give you a really good example, though, because it's such a mental image. One of where I see the genuine female gaze, right? So I don't know if you remember this, but it was a photographer in the 90s. It was called Corinne Day. She died of cancer a few years ago. She was the first woman. Well, I don't know if she was the first woman, but she created all these images of Kate Moss when she was only like something like 14, 15. She's totally young and it's Kate Moss. And nowadays it's totally inappropriate, of course, because I think she's wearing like a Native American kind of headdress and it's kind of like, you know why, but it's images of Kate Moss on the beach somewhere in England where Corn Day is photographing her and she's topless and she doesn't hardly got any she never had boobs but she hasn't got any boobs hardly because she's so young and she's laughing looking straight into the camera and in one way when i think about this kate moss who's 14 years old naked on the beach you're kind of like oh female gaze what is this all about but actually when you look at the image you can see that her and corn they are totally connected and i think that's the most elementary thing to be completely connected to not your subject, but the person, because it's a person you're photographing. So answering your question, if I moved these wild, naked, dirty bodies into a studio, the main thing for me would be to be completely connected to the person I'm photographing. Because you see, when we break that genuine connection, that's when it becomes objectifying. And what I feel when I photograph people in the woods rather than in the studio is that they hold their own space. I support them, but they hold the space. The leaves and the moss is holding them. Meanwhile, in the studio, and as a photographer, it makes me think, so what's the story we're telling in this studio? It will need to be a story applied onto the studio. Meanwhile, in the woods, the trees, and, and the water and the stars are whispering their own story. Uh, I don't need to add anything, it's complete. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> we can carry on forever, but I feel like it might be quite interesting actually to, to know how, w when, when people's images are censored, uh, do, they, do you inform them about it? And how, how do they feel about uh the fact that they their bodies are being removed from internet basically um i, I just saw a question which is quite good actually and, and maybe i should bring that up but so when my images get censored on facebook and instagram i mean my first 30 day span right was when i posted the image of my friend in eight month pregnancy right and the image that we created there was a little bit like her actually in the garden holding apple and that gave me the first 30 days ban and what i started to think about was i'm a business right i'm actually i might be wandering the woods with women and and looking at the moon howling at the moon but like i'm also a business and i was totally shocked because why has pornhub got all the fucking followers and that beautiful open account who's like floating the surface of this big sea of who's going to survive and who's going to not. Meanwhile, me with my, now I managed to get close to 4,000 followers. I don't even surface in this world where you go like, oh, that account looks good or that it's, I don't even exist there. And so I think one part of it is like, I don't inform people about the image being censored because I, I do have the time, but, but it would be just be so f frequently. And also, I, I don't want people, I don't want to fuel anger and I don't want people to be upset. So I create stories about it and the stories are more about my favorite word, whistle diet and representation. So be aware of what you see, be aware of what's being removed. Um, if you follow too many accounts who who make you feel shit, then delete them. So no, I don't inform people, but what I think is really important for my business, like actually making money and paying rent is, I have been penalized as an artist. And it's really cool because BBC did a whole, it's a 10 minutes kind of feature on me and my work. 
And I was looking at it the other day. Maybe we can share a link, actually. But they were like, Yannick Hane believes that the algorithms is um, limiting her visibility. And I'm kind of like, but look, fuck you. Like, what beliefs? Because when they released that thing on BBC, they also got in touch with Instagram. And straight away, I got in touch with Rachel, who created the feature. I was like, have you done something with social media? And she was like, yeah, because I started to get followers again, but that obviously being cut again. So I was like, actually, it's because sometimes I think it's just me being mental. But actually, it, it it's not about believing that. We are being censored as much as, <sighs> If someone feels rubbish, depending on the cycle of friends, but you go like, God, I'm feeling a little bit down today. And people go like, no, you don't. You have a good life, you know, cheer up. You know, it's like it's that censorship of the full picture, because again, it's like I don't just want to photograph. And that's why I'm really proud of my list. I didn't only set off to photograph old, hairy and fat women, it was like, that's the women I have around me. And the main point about it is that it's space for all of us, all of us. And the world world is immense. And I want to show that through my images. But as a business, um, the business of Facebook's business is to limit my business. But they do this though, because actually, going back to where we started, what would unfold if we could all be just what we are, full of life, moons, nature, waves, stars, you know, what will happen then? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This was absolutely Beautiful. I love listening to all you have to say and speaking about your work. Oh, like, really thank you so it. much. <laughs> thank you so and much. And also, for thank you. I really appreciate that because I think as well, it's really important that whole thing of like, thank you for giving, creating this space to do this. That's what I tried to say when I was going off ranting when we first started, because I think creating these kind of opportunities, creating these kind of platforms, creating, sitting around the fire, having these conversations, listening to each other, it's like it's really essential in that sense to finish can you let our listeners know where they can find you online and how they can work with you so for your listeners i would like you to connect with me on social media so that would be when the blackbird sings on instagram or yannicka honey where i have my the other stuff for my work and my website is www.yannickahoney.com don't go on Twitter. Twitter is not good. Twitter is when I'm premenstrual and I'm just tweeting out bad things. But the main thing I wanted to say is that if anyone wants to fire off an email to me, Yannicka at yannickahanne.com, and you have any questions, please do, because my work unfolds in togetherness. So having that conversation is really essential for me. It's not like I'm the photographer with my camera and you just people following me on Instagram. I have these exchanges all the time. And I also started something that's called Twilight Talks, where I got Cali on tomorrow night, where we're going to talk about censorship and gender and identity. So, um, yeah, it's all about communication. So get in touch. Beep, 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 beep.